All right, excited to be joined by Cameron Monahan today. How are you doing? We were just talking before we started here. We don't usually we're like talking to someone with only an AirPod microphone or like just a computer. You've got like the podcaster setup going, and it's just it. If you feel like you're one of us right now, it's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. I'm just like I'm setting up for my Twitch stream. You know, I'm <laughs> I'm just gonna be doing a bunch of Madden for the next few hours. So I just had to get the whole mic set up ready, and uh, now I'm gonna scream a lot and uh, hopefully get some views. <laughs> Oh, all you're missing is like a rainbow colored keyboard, like a keyboard that like just emanates rainbow colored light for some. Oh reason. yeah, in a gamer chair, man. Yes, exactly. Some serious gamer gear, you know, be uh, slurp down some like Red Bull or something, and just <laughs> fucking go. Am I allowed to <laughs> swear? Yes, I don't yes, know. Yes. Oh yeah, you all can. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's all right, like great. it's usually like an energy drink that you've never heard of, and then you'll never see again after one or two streams. That's usually like that's the other like staple of those things. Oh yeah, you remember balls? Do you remember balls oh, energy oh, yeah. drink? Oh yeah, hell oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it had the dots all over it. Yeah, that was that was classic. I, I, I want to bring balls back. This, we, this, we this, tried. Uh, this was sponsored by Balls. <laughs> yeah, so we tried to. We got it. Did, did you? Did you? No way. Office. Swear to God, like one of our first ever episodes, like four years ago. Our old, <laughs> we had another co-host. He, he hung up the podcast because he retired. Our, our friend Trill Ballins, and he talked about how he grew up drinking Balls energy drink, and Whoa. somebody sent us a box of it. But it was definitely not like a new box. It was they were Mm-mm. they were like filmy. It was it was great though. Vintage, aged, <laughs> aged yeah. balls, best. Exactly. We'll move, we'll move on to Zima <laughs> after that. Uh, but we, okay, so oh, we're nice. not just talking old energy drinks here. Let's talk. Let's get into talking about Shattered in theaters and on demand, January fourteenth, uh, and uh, available on Blu-ray and DVD, February twenty-second. A rich divorcee, Chris, falls in love with a mysterious woman, Sky, where Chris is ex-wife. And his child eventually gets trapped in a desperate fight for survival. Uh, will most likely ensue. Tell us, you feel like movie that we, Ken Jack and I kind of pull from this of recent times, a simple favor, maybe a little more edge mm. to it. Well, what would you compare this movie to and best describe to our audience? Um, I would say like uh, the basic instinct, poison Ivy, single white female, like those kind of uh, relationship thriller kind of stuff. But that being said, it also has a real dark, funny streak going on with the two uh, and the movie really like explodes in the later part of it. It's a, uh, it goes a lot further than what you think it's going to go. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. Like it, it combines like that kind of thriller notion with like, yeah, it has like a romance aspect, but then it's also like horror and like kind of a nightmare at the same time. It's, it's a, it's a fun ride is what I'll say. I think a lot of our audience, like they know you as being someone who can deliver a really good, crazy performance. And on this one, and this time, like you're kind of on the receiving end of the crazy yeah. person performance uh, from Lily Crew. What was that like? Uh, it was it was interesting. It was interesting. You know, um, uh, after after playing so many villain roles and like those kinds of guys, it is interesting to be on the other side of it and be like, oh, that's what that feels like. That's what I've been putting people through. Um, yeah, it, it was it was a lot of fun. Uh, she was really just like giving a ton of really fun stuff to bounce off of. And she has a great presence in the movie. And um, yeah, it was, it was a good time. Uh, Also produced by John Malkovich, who's also in the Mm. movie that has to be, I mean, you're, you're right around our age. I mean, but uh, John Malkovich is just one of those figures in Hollywood who it just, he just stands out. I mean, being from being John Malkovich to anything else he's in, how great was that? Not only being able to just act with John Malkovich, but someone who, you know, producing the movie as well. Yeah, man, it was sick. It, it was it was really cool. Um, that was obviously a, one of the big incentives b- to becoming uh, part of the project. Um, and, you know, I I always say, like, don't meet your heroes because usually they, they don't live up to it. Um, but he was great. He was uh, just a super solid guy. Great work that work ethic and like not a jerk, you know, uh, really supportive of cast and crew. Funny. And obviously he brought so much to it as well from a performance aspect. Uh, he is the main source of comedy for the movie. And uh, he's just really consistently he gets like a lot of laughs. And uh, yeah, it's a good time. Like, you know, he's got such an amazing voice and it's just so great uh, oh, yeah. listening to hear him talk. You know, I could just, I could, he's like my ASMR, you know, I just like wanted him to tell me a story because it was always just amazing to listen to him speak. And then I just worked with Morgan Freeman at right after that. It's just like two amazing voices. In a row. So, yeah, seriously, yeah. 
No, it's it, it was pretty sick. Um, yeah, just like uh, those were like my own personal like podcast experiences where I'm just like, just tell me a story, man, because this is, it's it's amazing. You sound so great. <laughs> That's so awesome. Um, I think one thing that kind of shocked me um, after I watched the trailer of it and then I went and just like looked at the details of the movie was that like I found out that Lee Krug was actually German and like mm. her American accent is so good in the trailer. Like I never even would have thought of that. Um, and that just made me think like, is there any sort of accent that you as an actor are dying to try out, whether it's, you know, Southern, New York or European, whatever. So there's one where you're like, I could probably do this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm really fascinated by Appalachian uh, like accents, like, um, you know, uh, hill dwelling people and uh, people who like live in the haulers, work in uh, coal mining, that kind of stuff. I think that that's just such an interesting aspect of American culture and something that we don't explore all that much. And that's because like they're they're geographically separated as well as uh, so much of the accent comes from like a historical like thing. It's like they, they, uh, a lot of them were like immigrants and migrants who kind of moved away. And so they developed their own little pocket of language. And I think that's just super cool. So I'd love to see that explored. Um, but you know, like accent and voice work is just some of my like favorite stuff. And I always look for the opportunity to be able to do that. Has there been one that, that maybe you're like, I don't know if I have it yet. Like you, you work on, is there one that uh, maybe besides when you just said, is there one though, like you've had in your back pocket, you're trying to really like, uh, maybe like, maybe like a bigger, I don't know if it's, I mean, British seems like the most stereotypical thing to ask an American, but you know what I mean there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, I don't, I almost like don't want to say it cause I, I don't want to be tested because I've never been one of the people that like, I don't like to like switch into an accent. I like to like speak in it and uh, actually just like live in that for a while. But that being said, I really like the Irish accent and it was something that I was terrible at upon first doing it. Um, but I've been working with a, uh, voice and dialect coach on it for a while now. And it's actually getting pretty consistent. There was a project that I was trying to develop, uh, about an Irish boxer that ultimately didn't get made, but, uh, it was good. It was like a really good learning experience and to kind of get like an understanding of the mechanics of voice, I think is really great. So, uh, hopefully, you know, I don't know if, if that will be an accent I ultimately ever end up doing, but it was a great learning tool regardless. I feel like we don't see enough of that, by the way. Like you always see, it'll be like, which is great. Like I love, I love seeing Keanu Reeves go around like a range and like learn how to be John Wick and all that. But I don't, we don't get enough of the uh, dialect and voice like mm-hmm. coach montages. Like I think we need well, more get- of that. It's like that's be, there's different ideas of what an actor is, isn't there? There's like the guys that are um just so great at what they do when you have like a i don't know like a nicholas cage or the rock or somebody like that who are just like they're so charismatic and fun and like you are so idiosyncratic that it's amazing for you just to be you and then you also have the other side of it where you have like a gary oldman or ben kingsley or something like that who are just completely transformative and then i think that the majority of actors live somewhere in the middle and try to be um uh, flexible in what they are, but I, I'm always been such a big fan of the character actors and the performers that are really just like our uh, chameleons and are able to completely shift. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's, that's my aspiration and, and hopefully something that I get to do more of in my career. That, Someone that else. No, go ahead. Oh, go yeah, ahead, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I was, I was going to say that just reminds me of um, one of your great roles that I love so much, which is in Shameless because uh, Ian Gallagher, I always found was just such a, com- a complex character with so many levels and like so many like bits of like gray, so to speak, which mm-hmm. is like, I feel like that must be hard to sort of get into as an actor. Um, but with that sort of role, one where, you know, going into it, that you're going to be able to just explore so many things beyond the surface level. Is that like the dream role for an actor, especially when you're looking at television? Yeah. I mean, that's definitely, it's definitely up there for just uh, amazing as an opportunity. Um, you know, I, that the writing was consistently really fun and really challenging on that show. Um, and it always kind of, threaded the line of allowing these characters to make a lot of mistakes and not necessarily always have um, the best motivations, but are usually coming from they're 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 extremely protective of like the people that they love. They're they're um, kind of products of their environments and um, they're really interesting to explore, even when they're doing things that you don't necessarily like about them. And I always that's to me, that's my favorite kind of stories are people that 
um, you don't necessarily immediately like, but you start to understand and empathize with them. I think that's more interesting than just have a person just be like, uh, oh, you're a good person. Cause it's like, yeah, you know, look, you make stories about those kinds of people too. And it can be interesting, but, um, I've always been a fan of a protagonist that t- tends to challenge you. Um, and yeah, I, I, Ian was always an exploration in that, especially uh, so much of his stuff was like relationship stuff and kind of like this chaotic and weird uh, and borderline abusive, but also extremely loving relationship that he had. And um, that was something really interesting to explore and to be able to do that in the long form over more than a decade is just like ridiculous and and, an opportunity that essentially no actors get. So I feel very lucky that I was able to do that. Well, that's, that's what I was going to ask you next. And and whenever we talk to someone who's been in a show for so long or a project that goes on for so long and you started it, what you, you're going to be like seven. How old are you when you first started set between 16, 18, right? Uh, I was uh, about to turn 16 when we filmed the pilot. So it's not like you were like five and you were oblivious to what you were doing, but like, Mm -hmm. what is your perspective now, like 10 years later? And with the show, like you said, a show lasting for five years nowadays is insane, let alone over a decade. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Like uh, I was at that kind of nexus point, like in my, like, just like life in general, where, you know, around 15, 16 is where you start really becoming an adult in many ways. It's where you start, uh, finding your independence, moving away, considering jobs, sex, like all that stuff starts really becoming a factor in your life. Uh, and it was kind of interesting because that was also the biggest career uh, opportunity that I'd had up until that point. Um, and it was definitely something that I was initially really intimidated by. Um, I wasn't sure if it was something that I wanted to do. It was um, really a lot. It was extremely like blunt and in your face. And uh, even though I was always a fan of stories like that, I wasn't sure if that was something that I wanted to do personally yet, because it was just like a very weird exposing thing. You know, I had like so many questions of like, oh, this character is uh, very really different from me in certain aspects. And it, do I feel comfortable putting myself out there in such a big way? And what, what will people think of me or whatever? And then ultimately I just kind of realized like, that's the responsibility of like a performer and what they're supposed to do is, you know, you have to, you, you should be doing things that you are intimidated by. Uh, you, you should be a little afraid of it and you can't, worry about judgments of like a character or a performance or something like that. You just have to just throw yourself into it. It's the only way through it really. Um, and if you're not doing things that you you're that are not in some way helping you also grow in your own perspective, then like, why are you doing it really? So yeah. um, it was, uh, it, it was definitely a challenging um, opportunity, but one that I was really thankful for, especially because I, got to meet so many incredible people who I became very close to and who I also really ad- admire as actors and, and creators as well. Mm-hmm. I, I like that you mentioned that just doing work that you find challenging because they're obviously, I think one role that a lot of our listeners are, are very hyped about that you had done before previously was just in Gotham playing mm-hmm. like the, the, playing the Joker essentially. And um, like you've talked before about how there was no bigger shoes to fill than Phil stepping into like the Joker. And I, th- I always wondered, was it like helpful just the fact that you were you're playing like a proto Joker, right? Mm. Like you were you were playing, you had space to sort of make the character your own versus trying to repeat or rehash anything that had been done previously. And I'm sure that must have been like just a helpful tool, I guess, for you or or, or limitation. Yeah, I mean, it was it was interesting because I never viewed the character as like this is the proto Joker or something like that. Look. I always felt the character was the Joker and upon immediately being introduced, I thought the only way to be able to play that was he is, but it's also, it's him when he was younger and it's about finding the character in a different context. And, you know, I, I mean, that's to be said with any role, regardless of what the figure that you are portraying as a name, you have to just look at what is it that is being presented within the narrative of the story. What are you trying to accomplish? What are you trying to communicate? And then you have to kind of go from there. So 
uh, all of the um, auxiliary stuff of like, uh, there's a lot of pressure about this and there's been great performances and blah, 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 really have to take a back seat and you just have to kind of take it one scene at a time and, and, and understand the character primarily as, um, you know, how they're existing within the story beyond anything else. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was, uh, that was definitely interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know if it was a, a, a help or a hindrance. It was just, it, it was, it was, it was what it was. The, the, the storyline too. And I feel like the kind of legacy within the show of, of that character and, and, you know, the twins come in, uh, killed off, like all like, it felt like there was craziness around the character. Did that mm. add to did it make it more difficult? Was it like an instability thing or like, did it kind of just add to the idea that it is a crazy character and there's just craziness around the character? Yeah. But I mean, the character might be from a viewer perspective, crazy, but again, you know, obviously you have to, um, you have to be living truthfully within a character. And from his perspective, he's completely reasonable. And, you know, what he's yeah. doing is the most sane thing in the world. Um, and he's just having fun uh, doing the things that he very much enjoys. The fact that those things tend to be uh, murder and chaos and torture are just, you know, yeah. taking a backseat to the fact that he's just trying to live his best life, man. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I think that ultimately, um, ultimately it was, it was really challenging because it was a, a story in long form and usually a character like that, they benefit from being there for a short amount of time. And you have a set arc and something already done for them. Um, and going from one season to the next was always challenging of like, oh, okay, so this is what we're going to do with the character. I don't know if that was necessarily what I was building towards in the previous season, how do I need to recalibrate? Like, what is it that I need to change? Um, that was always the hardest part of, of playing that character was just um, not necessarily knowing where it was going in the future and trying to, you, you can't like really like, you can't future proof a performance. You just have to do what makes sense yeah. at the time and hope that you're supported in the long run by where the story end up, ends up going. Reminder, Shattered in Theaters on Demand, January 14th. Now, you may be able to tell we like we like Star Wars a little bit. Just a just a touch. <laughs> yeah. I just, got the ticket back. Just there. mild Star Wars fans. Uh, yeah, I mean, just a little bit. Not not a ton. Mm. Um, you there's a little bit of news though. So for those who those who have not played the game, you play Cal, a Jedi in the Star Wars mm -hmm. universe, a in the canon of the Star Wars universe. Cannot say the mm -hmm. word canon uh, when it comes to Star Wars. Uh, a lot of rumors about Fallen Order two this week. Is there anything you can you can say on that? There's not anything I can oh, say. Oh, what a shock! <laughs> uh, yeah, I know, I know. It's, we had to. Yeah, no. <laughs> All I can say is it would be very nice to be able to return back to the character. Um, and when we were making the first one, we certainly had ideas of what we would like to do going forward. So uh, it would be very nice for us to be able to return to that and uh, explore some of those things. <laughs> we have to say we have bad luck would be an understatement. Uh, like uh, Will Reese, what's the guy? Let's go Reese. Oh, Will Poulter interviewed Will Poulter him the next day. He's announced Guardians. Adam Warlock. And right. <laughs> so like, like yeah, the day so, after. Yeah, tomorrow I'm sure you'll be tweeting like some official announcement. Would be like, oh, okay. Uh, um, but I I remember a video that you did when before this came out, which I think is one of the coolest things. Like one of the coolest like ideas to me as anyone in like your position. It was on like a Force Friday, and they released you opening up your action figure. Oh like yeah, yeah, yourself yeah. as a fucking toy, like that. Is there, is there anything like as cool in terms, like as cool as that? Like that has to be one of the coolest fucking things ever. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's so it's so cool because so much of like why we become actors or like anything like that was at least for me was because I was like a kid like playing with toys and playing on the playground. And, you know, I, like I was a huge fan of, uh, of not only star Wars, but like stuff like uh, the matrix and Harry Potter and, and, and that kind of stuff. And uh, I, you know, those toys were so valuable because they were the tools for our imagination. Mm -hmm. Like they were kind of yeah. that jumping off point. And it, that, you know, my hope is that a character like Cal becomes that for some kids somewhere else in the world 
you know, to, to then that is like, they're, they're, they're playing around with their stories of Cal and, and that gets their imagination going. And hopefully they, uh, one day get their own action figure because they they're doing their own thing, you know? So, yeah, I mean, that, that is just like one of those moments of like, Oh, wow. I, I guess, I, I, I guess I've, I've like made it. Like, I guess I I'm here. <laughs> like you're looking at it and it still is like really weird and surreal. You know, it sits, uh, it sits in my office, um, uh, on, on one of my shelves. And every time I see it, I'm just like, is, yeah, I guess I, I guess we did that. That's, <laughs> that's amazing. That was me with my Max Steel doll growing up. And then they made, I think they made it. Better, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so I think you lucked out in that with, ev- with every single Star Wars property that ever gets made, there's always a droid tie-in or a tiny droid mm. draw, drag tie-in. Not all of them are great, but BD-1 is like a top five most cute, adorable, amazing droid in the Star Wars universe. And I think that like you must have, I just imagine you coming on a set and seeing, cause I know they made that like 3d pr- uh, printed version of them for you when you were doing like mocap or whatever. And mm. uh, like, I can't imagine the relief when you see how great this droid is just looking at it. Right. BD one stands for best droid. Number one, <laughs> uh, in my opinion, because he is by far my favorite droid. And yes, I am really biased, but also I love BD so much. Um, it's actually, it's actually amazing. We have a really talented motion capture artist named Gideon Emery, who, uh, is on set with me every day. Um, anytime there's BD in the scene, which is, you know, pretty much all the time. And, um, it, if we didn't have him when we were making the game, I don't think that, uh, that character interaction would have worked. Um, we had our very first shoot. Uh, we shot without having him there. And basically we just had uh, the equivalent of like a green ball on a stick and who was holding the green ball changed from scene to scene. And they were just kind of reading the lines of like, yeah, let's go over there. Um, you know, and then we got Gideon uh, and he was, he, he's doing, he uses a, like a nose flute, like a, it's like a, this like nose whistle, it covers your mouth and you like breathe into it. It makes the, um and he was be able to be really emotive and expressive by doing that. Uh, and it helped because so much of the character interactions, because they're not, um, they're, they're not in English. So much of it is done through co- timing and context. And if you don't have someone who is on top of that, mm. those interactions just aren't going to work. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a, sh- a shout out to Gideon That's for crazy. that one, because like, yeah, it, we, we, the, that interaction, though, that dynamic, I don't think would work without him. You don't think about when you're playing a game like that or watch it, you don't think about the mm-hmm. nose whistle. It just doesn't come to mind. So. Yeah. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I don't. You also, I will say, so I, you're you're active on social media. Did you get tagged? Because I remember this. Your character, and thank God, because all my whole life I called them at at walkers. Did you get tagged a lot on Twitter when your character, when people realized your character called them at at walkers and not ATATs in Star Wars? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that like if you're growing up in any place, you have slang for stuff, and you know, it's it's it's. I, I I I thought that like the character wouldn't be so formal that he would be saying no, I, I agree. all the time. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, people, people call things, it's like calling a car, like a, a like an engine in a car, like a straight six or a, a, a flat six or whatever. It's like, you're not always going to be like, this is an inline six, or this is a boxer engine. This is whatever. Like you can call things a bunch of different things. And I don't know. I, 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 I think it's kind of funny. Like when people do get super pedantic about that stuff and then you <laughs> oh, consider yeah. Like in real life, like no one agrees about anything, you know, it's just like it's, everyone it's bad has for a lot ideas. of things, but Star Wars, Star is Wars another, fans. as two super nerds, yeah. sorry, Star Wars is like another, it's another level. Mm-hmm. But uh, I do have to say now, you know, your pronunciation is canon. And it's in the world. So, you know, you're welcome. I love it. <laughs> yes, there it is. Perfect. So satisfying. Yeah. yeah. Uh, something I think that we've all been looking forward to is just an eventual um, introduction of Cal Kestis into other Star Wars properties. I know when we were watching mm. um, Star Wars The Bad Batch, there was a scene with the Scrappers Union, which like I was like, oh, my God, Cal Kestis is about to show up. Didn't end up mm. happening. Um, we were waiting for maybe a potential live action series. And I don't know if you remember this, but you actually have a Mandalorian connection personally. Do you know this? Uh, remind me. I think I feel, I feel like I do know this. Wait, hold on. So, <laughs> All right, yeah, right now you just tell me. Just tell me. You voiced twins in an episode of The Last Airbender, which was directed by Dave Filoni, who is oh, the yeah. showrunner of oh, yeah. Lauren and Boba Fett. That's true. That's true. Yeah. 
So you, you have your in for the potential Cal Kestis series. But I've actually never met Dave Filoni, and I do very much sense. want to meet him. I, I really do admire so much what he's been doing. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I do have some crossover. I have the world's smallest part in Avatar The Last Airbender. <laughs> I, think I, say, I play twins and I have one line each. So, you know, but I that, that's another thing that is pretty cool to be like, yeah, but I still got to be on Avatar. So hell yeah. Yeah. Um, before and I will know they they just introduced a comic character crossed over. So I mean I think mm-hmm. it's, it's a matter of time before we see you live act. I mean not that I'm going to ask you. You couldn't tell us about the game. So at this point we'll just move on. And, yeah. and the Lucasfilm's got the scopes on you, so we won't you know we won't mm-hmm. we won't risk your life here. Uh, before we go, we always ask people this: six movies can be your six favorite movies. Can be a guilty pleasure thrown in there. Something you've seen recently that you want someone to see. Uh, just any six movies. Just throw them at us. Damn. Okay. Okay. Uh, I watched um, a bunch of Spanish movies because I just went to Spain. So I I was kind of just like watching a bunch of stuff that I had never really seen before. So I watched um, this movie called Bad Education, which was awesome with uh, Gael Garcia Bernal. Uh, one called Hamon Hamon that was like super crazy um, with Penelope Cruz. And like, I think one of her very first film roles um, uh, get, getting out of movies that I just saw recently. Um, actually, no, you know what? I want to stick with that. Let me just stick with this movies that I hadn't <laughs> I like really that. seen I like before. That. Um, I, I recently watched uh, this film series called Three Colors Blue. Um, oh, that was just, just like the blew my mind. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. Um, uh, th- those, those are a series of uh, Polish director, but French movies. Um, uh, I'd like to give a shout out to a movie called Fallen Angels, which is uh, a uh, South Korean. I'm oh, sorry. It's a Hong Kong uh, movie from the 90s that is just super sick and everybody should check it out. Um, where am I at on the number? Do I? Uh, yeah. You're one, two, two three, four. So two more. Four. Okay, two more. Um, let me throw it back old school because it just jumped into my mind. Uh, I hadn't seen 2001: A Space Odyssey in a while, and rewatching it again was just so like, good. man, why is this just? Why does this look so good still? Right. Um, and then let's go with something. I don't know. I'm just going to give love to Inglorious Bastards because I just mm. love that movie. You have to. I just, I just, I just love Inglorious Bastards. So, yeah, I got, yeah, I got, that's it. I got a poster of that up in my hallway. You can't see it. And my, my girlfriend was like, do we need a poster with like a giant swastika on it in the middle of the hallway? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, but they're, they're killing Nazis. That's the they're whole They're killing movie. Nazis though. So, exactly. you know. Wait, if, if you yeah. saw Spanish movies, did you see, and I, mm. there's no way to watch it in the US, The Good Boss with Javier Bardem. That's no, like, but that was that was on my list, and I was trying to get a hold of it. It is mm-hmm. apparently so damn good. I think it's the I think it's Spain's movie for the Oscars, and he talked about mm. it recently when he was talking about Dune, and he talked so glowingly about it. But I can't find it anywhere, and it's just it's mm-hmm. it's, it's maddening. I did watch like ten Javier Bardem movies, uh, but that was not one of them, unfortunately. <sighs> Mm. nobody can find and, and we can you can't find a movie in new york you can't find a movie anywhere <laughs> yep well we're starting a campaign we're putting pressure on them to release release it release it yeah, in america yes. there, there's a Put market we know there's at least two people in america that want to watch it <laughs> exactly <laughs> um thank you so much I, again uh shattered theaters january 14th and on demand this is, this is an absolute blast hope we get to talk to you again thanks thanks so much guys really appreciate it thank you that was yeah, fun. have a good one thank you